I want to go to the Marines. I want to explore the world and stuff, and find different experiences. During the late adolescent years, most individuals go through a period of time in which they're beginning to form a kind of coherent picture of who they are um, and who they want to be um, in the future. Adolescence is also important in terms of the development of new kinds of relationships. So there, there are very important changes in the domain of intimacy during adolescence. <laughs> At this time in my life, I'm more involved in learning and volunteering than ever before. There was an old 17th century view from Holland about the steps of life, climbing up the steps, and you reach an, a pyramid above, peak about 50, and then you take steps down. That overlooks the diversity of the people coming down, if you will. There never seemed to be enough time to pursue further into areas that I would have They're not coming down at all. First. They're going up. Now I have that time. And I am using it as I never could have in the early years of my career to busy. Adolescence and older adulthood. Two stages of development at near opposite ends of life. Both share a common thread of exploration, discovery, and growth. Life is development from womb to tomb, from childhood to adolescence, but also through early and middle adulthood and through the retirement years and into the years of old age. We are always in the process of becoming. Adolescence is a transitional time when children are becoming adults. It's a period marked by profound physical and psychological changes. Typically we think of it as being um, bounded at the younger side by puberty, the onset of puberty, the physical changes of adolescence, and ending really more in a social sense when individuals develop financial independence and residential independence from their family of origin. But we can also think of adolescence, roughly speaking, as spanning the ages from 10 to 20. One of the most important features of adolescence is the biological, sexual maturation of the individual. And puberty is a hormonal event that changes the outer physical appearance of the adolescent. Girls, on average, go through puberty about two years earlier than boys. The adolescent will grow typically 12 inches or more in a relatively short period of time. We call that the, the adolescent growth spurt. Um, and there will be a commensurate increase in weight um, as well. Probably most people think of puberty, though, um, for the development of, of what we call secondary sex characteristics. So in girls, we'll see the development of breasts, for example. Um, in both genders, we'll see changes in the sex organs, the development of pubic hair. Um, in males, the lowering of the voice. All of these are changes that take place during puberty. They're getting the increasing secretion of testosterone, and in the case of the female, the fluctuations and that sort of thing, of estrogen hitting the brain. So the sap is rising and that will activate those circuits in the brain that have been sitting there in the wings waiting. The brain of a child at the onset of puberty will differ vastly from the brain of a young adult. Development of the limbic areas, for example, can trigger more drastic changes in emotion. If you look at a group of kids laughing, they laugh a lot louder than adults do. Um, when kids get sad, they get a lot sadder than adults do. Um, and there's even some indication that kids like to prolong those states. What do teenagers do when they feel sad? They like to listen to sad music, which you would think you wouldn't want to do if you felt sad. And adults tend not to like to listen to sad music when they feel sad. They like to distract themselves from it. Sometimes, like, if I, I, I can control my temper if I'm, like, if I'm around a lot of people. And uh, I can control my temper and not to give me a bad name, but other than that, I try to, I try to, try to control it every time. There seems to be a, a kind of almost a, a, a drawing of kids toward higher levels of emotional arousal, both negative and positive emotional. But yet they don't have the cognitive skills that adults do in terms of regulating those emotions. The frontal lobe of the brain 
um, is the part of the brain that's most important for what we call executive function. So higher order cognitive skills, planning, thinking ahead, um, coordinating emotion and, and cognition. And that part of the brain we now know um, continues to mature during adolescence. Probably even through the early 20s, individuals become much more capable of sophisticated thinking. They're much more able to think abstractly. They're much more able to think um, hypothetically. They're much more able to um, think about things that aren't yet in existence, as opposed to uh, the thinking of, of younger children, which is very much limited to the here and now. While the early stages of child development are characterized by rapid connecting of neurons in the brain, that process changes during adolescence. When puberty hits, there's a genetically determined and probably stress-enhanced destruction, intentional destruction of the connections in the brain. They're being destroyed by this genetic push for what's called parcellation or pruning. So the period between the onset of puberty let's say 13, 14 years of age, and about 23, 24 years of age, that 10 year period. You have a massive restructuring in the brain. We think evolutionarily it's beneficial. In essence, what it's doing is becoming specialized. You see, having all those extra connections is not so useful for being efficient. The potential is great, but when the potential is great, the efficiency is usually low. So in adolescence, what happens is the experience a child goes through during adolescence allows those circuits to be carved out. So a kid who's playing lots of sports or a kid who's doing lots of music will, in fact, have those circuits really well developed. By the time they're done with adolescence, that will probably be something they'll continue for their life, too, although the body obviously changes. The brain is always open to new connections being established, but these Deep circuits may have their formation during this adolescent period in a very profound way. It is also during this period that adolescents begin to sense the stirrings of an unresolved yet independent self. In early adolescence, what we see often is that kids become much more self-centered. Not, um, not egotistical, but egocentric. Um, in the sense that they really do believe that the world revolves around them and their concerns. Everybody always pass the ball to me because they always look up to me and they always expect me to make a shot. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah. Juanita likes a lot of attention too. She likes to be on the spotlight all the time. There's a phenomenon that psychologists call the imaginary audience, which is that sense that kids often have that everyone is looking at them. So that a kid will go off to a concert um, and be unhappy with what she's wearing because she believes that all 20,000 people in the arena are going to be noticing her and looking at her. Kids also may engage in what we call the personal fable, um, which is the belief that somehow your life is unique and special in a way that makes it different from other people. These early stirrings of the self include the trying on of different personalities and roles. They're kind of continually negotiating, who am I? And what am I going to turn out to be? I'm going to be a pilot. Just a, maybe a private pilot. Not Air Force or anything, probably. I just like flying. Not staying on the ground and stuff, just up in the air. And... 12 and 13 and 14 year old kids begin to think about this and it worries them a little bit. And so what they're doing continually is looking around for answers to these numerous and unending questions. What kind of a life am I going to have and how, what do I have to do to get there? Media make it very easy for kids to try on all sorts of roles because it gives them a wide array of roles. They can go in there and they can say, well, I saw somebody on Friends act this way and I saw somebody act that way and what if this and what if that and sort of play these things out in their mind and, and, and tease out what parts they want to keep and what parts they don't like to keep. This is something that the theorist Eric Erickson called the psychosocial moratorium. Having a moratorium in which you can experiment with different roles, in which you can kind of try on uh, different personalities, um, both in reality and in your own mind, um, is a really important part of the identity development process. At the onset of puberty, conflict with parents increases. My dad makes me do my homework. 
and he checks on me, and he's a teacher too, so that's how he makes me do my homework. We talked this morning about this. I said, Thomas, get up early and get started on this work. My dad is very strict, and he's the only one that's strict and sometimes kind of mean. Yeah. There are several psychosocial issues during the adolescent years. One of them concerns autonomy and independence, um, establishing a new kind of relationship with one's parents in which you have more control um, over your life and in which you're much more of an emotionally separate person. I just want to have some privacy, okay? It's no big deal. Conflict between parents and kids increases around the time of puberty and doesn't decline until middle or late adolescence. And the conflict is not about big things. It's about trivial things, like picking up your clothes off of the floor, um, or uh, how late you can stay out on Thursday nights, um, or what time of day you do your studying. This bickering and squabbling is part of the process of kids developing a sense of autonomy and a sense of independence from their parents. Go now! Just a few short years ago, these adolescents were children glued to their parents' side. Changing the bonds of attachment and establishing autonomy requires a new path of exploration, and with that, risk-taking. One of the interesting findings from developmental psychology is that, you know, that the adolescents who do absolutely no risk-taking at all um, have, tend to have worse longer-term outcomes than the ones who take some moderate risk. So some part of that seems to be part of, you know, figuring out our environment, becoming more confident, and all those things. The research of Lawrence Steinberg of Temple University has uncovered evidence that teen risk-taking is linked to changes in the adolescent brain. This is really very interesting. What we now think is happening is that around the time of puberty, the part of the brain that regulates things like risk-taking, sensation-seeking, arousal, and so forth, amps up. Um, and so there is biologically an increased drive toward greater and greater sensation seeking and risk taking as a result. The part of the brain that helps us regulate ourselves, um, that helps us think ahead, that helps us weigh the costs and benefits of taking a chance, this part of the brain does not fully mature until the early to mid 20s. And we think that this helps explain why there is this increase in risk taking that takes place during the adolescent years. We've been very interested um, in our lab um, in the impact of peers on decision-making and on risk-taking. A lot of research on risk-taking and decision-making um, studies people by putting them in rooms by themselves and having them fill out questionnaires about what they think is risky or what they would do in different hypothetical situations. But we know that in the real world, especially in the real world of teenagers, most risk-taking takes place in groups, not when kids are alone. So we designed a study in which we had people of different ages come to our lab and they brought two friends with them. One of the tasks was a driving game. And in this game, um, it, it kind of simulated the situation in which you're approaching an intersection and the light turns yellow and you have to decide whether you're going to stop or whether you're going to try to make it through. Um, and we could measure how many chances people took by looking at how many intersections they drove through, how long they kept the car going, how many times they crashed, and so forth. So what we found in this study was that when people were alone, we didn't see any differences in risk-taking comparing adolescents, college students, and adults. Um, but when friends were in the room, we see a big increase in risk-taking among the adolescents. Kids who are raised in permissive households are much more susceptible to peer influence than kids who've been raised in what we call authoritative households. And then it also varies as a function of age. So if you were to map out susceptibility to peer pressure over time, what you'd see is that it increases from childhood through early adolescence. It peaks at around 14 or so, and then it starts to decline again. So an eighth grader or a ninth grader is going to be much more susceptible to peer pressure um, than a twelfth grader um, or a fourth grader. While the beginning of adolescence is marked by obvious physiological changes, the end of this period is less exact. 
kids seem to cease to be adolescents when they take on adult roles. So for some kids in our society, and for a lot of kids in a lot of societies, this can happen as young as 14 or 15. They get married, they start to have children, they work at a full-time job. For others, they may not take on those adult roles until 30. By the mid-20s, the physical strength of young adults reaches its peak. Changes in the brain brought on by puberty are largely complete with a more fully developed prefrontal cortex. During this time, autonomous young adults reap the benefits of the cognitive and social changes of the past 10 years. People become more conscientious, more responsible in that decade of the 20s, and people learn how better to handle their emotions so that their emotions don't fluctuate so much, they are better able to handle stress, less likely to experience anxiety and depression. Adulthood is a stage of life further broken down into segments. Early adulthood continues until about age 40. Middle adulthood is a period from the early 40s until about age 60 or 65. Chronological ages, however, are only a broad guide to the evolving individual. Adults may get married, have children, or change careers. Life events such as these characterize the transitions of adult development. Our chronological age is a very rough indicator of how well we are functioning, even what stage of life we are at. And so that's a real limitation of many of the stage theories. Our development is much more continuous than the stage theories would suggest. Chronological ages are also susceptible to stereotypes. Such is the case with adults in their 40s who have reached midlife. Midlife is a time during which many adults are beginning to feel less confident about their physical attractiveness, less confident about their sexual appeal. This kind of anxiety often leads adults to question how well their lives are progressing. Am I on the right path? Did I marry the right person? Is this the kind of work that is right for me? And they may make dramatic changes at that time. And this was termed the midlife crisis. So a man would divorce his wife and go out and buy a shiny red sports car. But when they began to investigate this idea, they found some individuals did experience what could be called a midlife crisis. But it didn't seem to be linked with any particular interval of time and that in a study of women, they found that the uh, crises that they did have tended to occur more in their 20s and tend to be linked with unexpected and typically undesired events. Things like a divorce, a death of a loved one, or being fired from our job. Work and career become increasingly important in early adulthood and beyond. A subject of intense focus for several decades, career achievements often become a primary source of self-esteem and stability. So much so that adults often define themselves by what they do. For aging adults, the loss of work due to retirement marks a major event in the life progression. Some welcome this transition. Others find it difficult. It's almost like losing a spouse, a wife, or a husband. The meaning in your life is gone. And it takes about two years for the retiring person to get over it. Loss of work, declining health. These images of older adults give rise to myths about aging. But as elders are a growing demographic in the population, Psychologists are helping to reveal a more positive, more realistic side to aging. With age, you develop more self-control. Uh, you live through something. Experience accumulates with age. When you're at college age, you have a fairly high vocabulary. You know about 23,000 words. By the time you're 60, you're going to double that to 46,000. 
but also we have mastered many things so our actual self improves so there's less distance between the actual self and the ideal self so that leads to less tension and less frustration when you're getting older and that contributes to wisdom sharing wisdom is a passion for james Buren, professor emeritus of gerontology at the university of southern california across the country Buren's guided autobiography workshops allow retirees a chance to integrate their choices from the past while still looking forward to the future we meet for two and a half hours a week and uh, we get the people to write at least two pages and I'm very proud that I helped design and build one of the first digital computers at the University of Illinois back in 1948 and I returned to school after the new year as a different person I was no longer sick and mainly I was no longer afraid in doing this you think back oh my gosh look what I've done in, in my life so self-esteem goes up you also get attached to other people in the group and these people go on and do other things together I am now 74 and still practicing law part-time I never thought that I would reach this age Though these adults clearly defy the stereotypes of old age, certain physical and cognitive changes are inevitable with aging. At the age of 87, I have been fortunate to have retained most of what is facetiously referred to as my marbles. Mark Twain has a famous quote that I've used in many of my talks. The essence of it is that when I was young, I could remember anything, whether it happened or not, but as I get older, I find I can only remember the things that never happened. It's sad, but it's going to happen to all of us. Older adults have trouble coming up with names relative to younger adults. Uh, when, say, you show them a picture, uh, even a famous person, they're not too bad at that, but they'll be slower than younger adults. So uh, the other thing, though, that Mark Twain put his finger on is that older adults show a greater tendency to have false memories, to remember things differently from the way they happened, or in the most traumatic case, to remember something that uh, didn't happen to them at all. While older adults are vulnerable to changes in memory, including those brought on by Alzheimer's disease, correlational evidence suggests that an active mind is a healthy mind. A lot of people are advocating doing things like crossword puzzles and mentally challenging things. Yes, older adults, the ones who are the most cognitively fit, also tend to do those kinds of activities. That's certainly true, but it's unclear whether they do them because they can. Did those things create better memory in, in older adults, or is it the older adults with better memory choose to do the things that rely on memory? Looking at a number of studies that have come out, physical exercise in older adults, maybe because it keeps oxygen flowing to the brain, uh, but that really seems to protect against cognitive loss as well as being good for you for other reasons, obviously. When you take good care of yourself and th that sort of thing, but you are aware that uh, sooner or later something's going to creep in and get you. <laughs> but that's part of... Uh, uh, existence. It's the way it is. There's nothing you can do about it. Although all animals experience fear in response to things that could end their lives, only humans have the intellectual abilities to realize that death is inevitable. So only humans really know that they have to die. Most people deny the prospect of their own death. They say, yes, I'm going to die, but they really don't think about it until it's thrust upon them. And even then, our tendency is to say, not me. I sometimes feel as though I'm living on borrowed time. I'm not actually jumping my grave, but 85 years, I don't fear death. I suppose I inherited my mother's strong belief that there's life after death. And that this life is just a second of the But time what the Elizabeth Kubler Ross contributed so, is, is the, the idea, and I believe it's true, that people want to talk. This is the most important thing that is happening to them at that moment, and that's what they want to talk about. Let the person who is concerned speak out their wishes and anticipation. This is where we often make the mistake of blocking that. But even though I'm over the hill, I still like to get up in the morning because I have a loving family 
and close friends. I love music and travel. I've been singing in our church choir for nearly 30 years and have had the opportunity to, to learn some great music. I think it also helps to have a sense of mission and purpose. And this is true at every age. People who have something that captures their attention and their sense of purpose that's bigger than self live with greater well-being and make richer contributions than people who are self-focused. Psychologist Eric Erickson theorized that the developmental task of the elder years is to reflect on life and integrate its triumphs and failures. And he believed that that capacity to integrate all of those strands of our life together into a meaningful whole uh, made us more accepting of our own death. Without that, we are faced with despair. And so what Jim Buren has done is he's given a person an opportunity to learn how to uh, engage in this life review process, not just right before we die, but at any point, generally in that adult phase. And by understanding where we've come from, we can also make more reasoned decisions about where we want to go. Is this an egotistical trip on the part of older people to impress the young? I don't think so. I, I turn it around and say, it's really a way of releasing the wisdom of people who have lived a long time and lived through many things. And it opens the doors to younger people of the wisdom that uh, exists. I refuse to worry about what tomorrow may bring, but will try to live this day to its fullest. My cup may not run it over, but it's still more than half full. Your cup is remarkably full, I think. <laughs> I think you should all get wise medals. I wish I had some. <laughs> Inside Out is a 22-part series about psychology. For information on this program and accompanying materials, call 1-800-576-2988 or visit us online.